fish hook. Good. Okay. So I have one with me. Salute. Uh, and it goes from these hills over here. You can kind of see that that's a little hill, a big hill there, big round top, and a smaller one called little round top. Okay. That is over here. The Union Line continues out that way for two, two and a half miles to Cemetery Hill. Then it curves around Culp's Hill. Okay. 90,000 soldiers. Okay. The Union Army under Meade, 90,000 soldiers on a line about three and a half miles long. The Confederates show up and line up around them, okay, because that's what you often do in the Civil War. But this tells us a lot, right? If General Lee needs to get a guy from here to here, it's six miles. Meade only has to go two and a half, okay? General Lee has fewer soldiers, maybe 70,000 on a longer line. Meade has more soldiers, maybe 85, 90,000 on a shorter line. He's more compact. Meade also has the high ground, Little Round Top, a ridge called Cemetery Ridge leading all the way out to Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill on his line, okay? Meade is also remaining on the defensive, which in war is a very important thing. You usually need fewer troops to defend than to attack. And then finally, for once, the Union has something it hardly ever had in the Civil War, the home field advantage, okay? And as a Bears fan, I know something about not having home field advantage when I happen to be in Wisconsin. So although General Lee won a huge victory on the first day, pushed the Union Army back, the Union Army sort of mitigated that victory, sort of took back that victory. And one of you all said that. It's kind of a mixed thing, right? Um, because General Meade, the Union Army, has taken up a strong, compact, defensive position on the high ground with more troops, with lines where he could shift troops back and forth easily on the home turf. Huge advantages for the Union, right? The one thing Robert E. Lee has going for him here is that he won the day before and won most of the last year, okay? Lee has a good record in battle. And whatever you hear about this dude in the news, he can be controversial sometimes, right? But he is an extraordinarily dangerous military opponent, okay? You do not want to go up against this guy unless you're ready, and it probably unless you have more troops. He was very good at that, and history shouldn't erase that. He was excellent at it, no doubt about it, okay? So General Lee is going to decide eventually to attack the flanks, the ends of the Union line, okay? That happens to be this general vicinity, but I'm not talking, I can't point to the spot because we're talking about a line a mile wide. Okay, and on the other side, a half a mile wide. So they're going to be attacking Culp's Hill on the other side and Cemetery Hill and places that are now famous, at least to Gettysburg nerds, Gettys nerds, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the Peach Orchard, Cemetery Ridge, and a lot of other things that you can't see now, but you will. Okay, and what that sets up is all this terrible fighting. And it doesn't go so well for the Union at first. The Union isn't positioned very well, namely because of one particular general that I'll talk about when we're on Little Round Top, okay? So that's sort of a setup. Does that make some sort of sense? Questions about that? Is there any witness trees around here? Uh, not right around here. Now, ha having said that, I'll show you a good one at Devil's Den. Okay. Having said that, there is no organized effort specifically for the park to go and do core samples on trees and whatnot. So the witness trees I know about are ones that we have pictures of in 1867 and then in 1880 and 1910 and 1940 so that we know it's the same tree. Those are most of the ones I know, okay? Some of the ones, I mean, it has to be really big to be able to say, that's a witness. Because some, one of the witnesses that stands near Pickett's Charge is only about like this. It's a honey locust, I believe it is. And it just, it just they don't grow that large, but it's old. Good question. Anything else? Now, speaking of witnesses, here are maybe not living, but witnesses. These boulders, of course, were here during the battle. People often ask, you know, were these rocks here during the battle? Yeah. And uh, don't worry about asking questions you think might be stupid because I've had people ask me everything. Why are all battles fought in national parks? I mean, just think about that. Like they created the parks first and the troops said, oh, it's a park. We're going to fight there on that battlefield because it's already the Gettysburg battlefield. OK, where do they put the monuments in the winter? How did they know where to put the monuments before they fought there? These are adults, by the way, asking these questions. And usually it's the kid. So keep this in mind. Say, no, dad, they fought here. Then they put the monument here. OK, so don't worry about asking me questions. I've heard them all, including were these rocks here during the battle? I'll also prove to you that the rocks were largely right where they were during the battle. Now, I imagine Mr. Weggy already spoke a little bit about these. There are more monuments here than you'll see anywhere in the world. 
1,400 monuments, markers, and tablets, okay? And, you know, if we spent two minutes at each one, we'd be just doing monuments for 46 hours, okay? So you've already seen me pass by a dozen or two dozen monuments um, without saying a word about them. But these are place-based monuments meant to tell us what happened here. And here's a monument to the first Vermont, okay? And I'm going to have to fast forward a little bit because on July 2nd, 1863, the Confederates advanced through here, okay? And let me just say something about that. This will be the fighting at Little Round Top and Devil's Den. The Confederates advancing right here, right where you stand, are Alabamians. The Alabamians marched farther to get here than anybody else on this whole part of the battlefield, more than 20 miles on what would become the second hottest day of the summer, okay? Hotter than today. They're carrying 50 pounds of stuff each, okay? And many of them have empty canteens, so they try to get water, so they gather up their canteens, go looking for water, but the time for the attack has come. And now the most tired and exhausted troops on the whole battlefield are going to have to make the first and most important attack of the day against the end of the Union fish hook without any water on this hot day. Okay, so, you know, you've had it rough. We've all had it rough. I've stayed up all night. You know, before in my life, I was usually either working or having a good time. Okay, I certainly wasn't marching over a mountain down the other side 20 miles to get to a battlefield and then make this attack. So just remember, it's easy to see these soldiers in black and white and think they're somehow different than you know. They were as smart as you or as dumb as you. They wanted to live as long as you do. They had the same hopes and dreams that you have, okay? And they were in color, despite what you see in pictures, okay? So they're just like we are. The one thing I've learned about the Civil War more than any other thing is how like the people of the past we are. We like to think that we're smarter than people of the past. We would have done something better or different. We cared more. You can't help it. Every generation does it. Just like your parents think they're smarter than you probably. And you're going to think the exact reverse if you don't already soon. <laughs> okay, it's just, it's inevitable because we all think we know better. So across here march the Alabamians and there's going to be a terrible fight on Little Round Top and fighting on Devil's Den that I'll cover later. Fast forward. All that fighting takes place, Devil's Den, Little Round Top, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, Cemetery Hill, and Culp's Hill. And then the next day, there's a terrible fight in, in the movie, it would be called the Cinta, okay, in the center of the Union lines. That's my best Virginia accent, okay, and that's Pickett's Charge. After Pickett's Charge, a very antsy cavalry commander, a guy named Kilpatrick, okay, kind of, I, I, I picture him talking like this, like really excited, not that I mind excitable people. Okay, but, but this dude was really just getting worked up all the time. I'm gonna attack. So after the attack at Devil's Den and Little Round Top, the next day the Confederates mostly lost. So they're sort of strung out over here and they're going across this field. There's some Alabamians probably along that stone wall. We really don't know. By the way, the stone walls are where they were during the battle. The fences are not only where they were during the battle, but they are the types of fences that were at that spot during the battle, okay? That's why this park is here. So there's Alabamians over there, and then there's Texans dotting the way along here, sort of, you know, six feet apart as a skirmish line, kind of a screen, just in case the enemy, the Union, comes charging down Big Round Top. That would be crazy, okay? And that's just what these cavalrymen do. Remember, cavalry, they're not the foot soldiers. Those are the infantry. They walked up here from Virginia. They're going to walk on back again, too. Cavalry ride on what? Horses. Horses, the cavalry soldiers. So when you hear about cavalry, imagine, doo -doo 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 -doo, against this ground, Okay, sorry. Okay, pounding across this field, they lead this charge. The commander of the charge, his name is Elon J. Farnsworth, a Michigander, I believe, who had just been made a general from captain, by the way. That's captain uh, up to major, lieutenant colonel, colonel general. Okay, he got prom promoted several ranks at once to command um, this brigade. Four regiments in this battle. And you've got Vermonters, New Yorkers, Pennsylvania, and I think some West Virginia soldiers as well. And they're going to charge down Big Round Top and into the Confederates, okay? The Southerners aren't that strong here, and they just kind of stand there, and the cavalrymen go whoo, pound through, right? Right through this area, okay? They get into the Confederate rear, but there's only several hundred of them in the Confederate rear. What are they going to do? If they had 10,000 of them, big difference, okay? But a few hundred of them are just getting shot at, their horses are going down, and they sort of make a loop here, and they get back, but not before the commander, Elon J. Farm, has been killed. And we all talk about where that's happened. Nobody really knows, but maybe it's out in this field that we call the D-shaped field. Guess what it's shaped like? A D, okay? If you look at this from above, and you can kind of see from here, okay, that it's sort of shaped like a D. It certainly looks like that on Google Earth, okay? So the D-shaped field is this interesting attack, 
okay? By the way, I mentioned that there were these Texans here, and if we start to talk about it, you're gonna see that these are the same Texans who were fighting at Devil's Den the day before, that these are the same Texans fighting in a place called the Cornfield at Antietam the previous fall. These are gonna be the same Texans who are gonna attack at the Battle of the Wilderness, and on and on again, and I guess what I wanna say is, we're looking at one battle here, okay? But the 6th Wisconsin, the 1st Texas, and all these units, they fought again and again and again and again, okay? It's just unbelievable. And, and I think the time of COVID is an interesting thing where you see the body counts piling up, right? A lot of Americans have died recently um, beyond the number that actually die, right? Imagine losing 620,000, maybe 750,000 Americans over the course of four years in a war that a lot of people just wanted to let the South go. And the South is saying, hey, just let us go. We don't want to fight anymore. It must have been very tempting. President Abraham Lincoln, I think, had the hardest job of any president, in my opinion. Of course, I'm a little biased because I really enjoy the Civil War. Um, what didn't I cover that you would want to cover here? Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to come here with that background noise is because we don't talk much about the cavalry. Okay, and for you just to get a, a picture of Union cavalry, what they faced, but especially talk about one thing, the ground and how unsuited this is to horses. Yeah, good. Okay, so if you're in a cavalry battle, by the way, this is not what a Civil War battlefield usually looks like, okay? Civil War soldiers, even though they fought on mountains and along rivers and streams sometimes, they usually fought in open fields, okay? And the foot soldiers marched shoulder to shoulder in a way that looks really stupid to us. I'm sure I'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? And the cavalry went in and they liked flat open ground. I mean, imagine, you don't even know, especially in midsummer, if there are big rocks in there. And if there's a horse on either side of you, the horse doesn't see that there's a big boulder in there and that boulder is not going to move because of some horse's hoofs. Um, they are going to get tripped up. The horse falls, the rider is pitched. What if it happens to too many of them at the wrong time, okay? In fact, you're probably focusing on where you're going, not going as quickly and not shooting your weapon if you're just trying to pick your way across a field like this, okay? This was, you know, one of those mistakes and more. I mean, this happens. Nobody has a perfect idea. You have plans, but those plans go out the window usually the second that you put your plan into action. It goes that way in a lot of ways in life that you'll see. Okay, so this is very difficult. Now, imagine though, just while we're here and before we leave, you know, you could hear maybe the horses pounding. I mean, that's what they said. They talked about horses pounding in a charge because you could literally feel the ground tremble. Then imagine the soldiers screaming, okay? Then imagine click, click as the Confederates are loading their guns, getting ready to shoot the Union, okay? They're putting back their ramrods and they're firing away and then pop, 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 pop. You start to hear it. And if you can do this while you're at a historic site, maybe you can do what I hope you'll do, and that is shrink that distance between the past and now, okay? And that's my job, of course, at the American Battlefield Trust, and in all things personally, is to make the past not seem that long ago. You know, Civil War seems a lot longer ago, but I've met 100 people who met Civil War soldiers. You know, um, you know I'm finding fewer of them now. But, you know, I only missed it by 11 years when, you know, the last Civil War veteran died. There might even be a couple people here who could have met the last surviving Civil War soldier in 1956. He's a Minnesota man, sorry, Minnesota. I gotta speak your language. I've lived out east more than half my life, so I've lost my Midwest accent if I had one. So you talked about like having your plan and then like a lot of times not going. It seems like the Union barely slipped into position in time to make Gettysburg happen. Was there a secondary plan like coming up short somewhere else? Yeah. If they weren't able to get here? It's really interesting you bring this up. So, was, you know, Sometimes you talk about what's called a meeting engagement where troops bump into each other. And that's what Gettysburg was. This was not a grand plan. Let's meet, let's fight. Neither commander wanted it. Neither commander was here when it started. So first of all, it, it was you know, where they bumped into each other and both sides sent the remainder of their troops here until it grew into the largest battle ever fought on this continent. General Meade, for his part, had certain things he had to do. Beat the enemy army and cover the roads to Washington and Baltimore, 50 and 70 miles away. I'm sorry, 60 and 70 miles away. Okay, so he had to stay near those roads and General Meade, the days before, two days before this battle, laid out a nice line behind a creek called Pipe Creek and told all his commanders, if we have to fall back, we're going to that line. Meade obviously decided not to do that. He ordered his troops to Gettysburg and won. Let's, let's not forget that, okay? People don't know who Meade is today the way they know who General Grant or General Lee is. But man, Meade showed up here, fought the most dangerous Confederate army after only being in command for how many days? Does anybody know? Like a month. No, three days. 
We've all had tough jobs in our lives that way too, but three days, okay? No on-the-job training really to be the big boss, okay? It is one thing. A lot of people you'll meet in your life act one way when they're not the boss and another way once they see, ooh, <laughs> this is a little bit different. I have more to think about now, okay? So Meade, you know, fought as a new commander and beat the Confederate Army on the home soil. So it was a big, big deal, Gettysburg. Anything else? What was the best way for the infantry guys, the harder going the cavalry versus infantry? Did they take the horses out? I mean, what were their, what was the way you fought somebody? I mean, you see movies. Yeah. You know, what's the reality of it? So, you know, infantry, foot soldiers against cavalry, the infantry is almost always going to win. Okay, first of all, it's hard to get as many cavalry as the enemy has infantry. Most armies have a lot of infantry, foot soldiers just doing that. Two, the infantry can sit behind a wall or a fence and shoot at you. And three, before the Civil War, you started to see more of a weapon called the rifled musket. Let's just talk about this now. We'll, we'll save time later, okay? And rifled muskets, before the Civil War, muskets fired round bullets, okay? But rifling means that inside the barrel of a gun, there are grooves that make it spin as it leaves the barrel, and they fired these things, okay? They're called conical bullets. What we know is bullets now. They're bullet shaped, right? Here you go. Don't lose it. It's real, okay? So it goes inside the barrel and it takes to the grooves because it's soft lead and it expands and it goes out. And suddenly these infantry guys can get off two, three, four more shots at the, at the Union soldiers before they get to them. In the old days, you see in movies, oh, here comes the cavalry, watch out. You might be able to fire one shot and then they're on you. And then, oh my God, they've, they're slashing at you and everything like that. But in the Civil War, the infantry almost always won. In this case, the Union cavalry went through, but they didn't accomplish anything at all. So that's, and that, that's how it usually goes. The, they either don't get near the infantry or they don't accomplish anything. Good. Last one. The use of horses, did, were mules used also, or was it just horses carrying the uh, wagons of supplies and ambulances and so on? Good. Now, I'm a city boy. So I think I know the difference, although don't ask me to identify the ears and everything one or the other, but cavalry is horses, straight up. Mules pull wagons and mules and horses pull artillery, okay? So um, there is a big difference, and donkeys and, can I say asses? Okay, because it's, it's what they are, actually, okay. Okay, good, okay, uh, last one for real. Because I don't want to anger Riley's sister, I'm scared. <laughs> Yeah, because in this case, you know, it was only that thin screen of, of Confederates. Remember, they're six feet apart, so there was room for the horses to get through. It's a really good thing. If they'd have gone that way toward the Alabamians, who were shoulder to shoulder, no way. Well, I think no way. And then when they did break through, the thousand who charged, only a couple hundred broke through, and it didn't really make a big difference. So I think that's a really good question. It's hard to determine that. Now, before we leave while that bullet's making its way around, just know that most of the battle wounds of the Civil War are caused by those bullets, right? Because you can shoot them far, they fly more accurately and everything like that. That's what rifling is. But when it hits something, rock, dirt, bone, anything like that, it, it flattens and disfigures, okay? That means what it's going to do is it's going to enter you. It's going to hit, you know, your uniform. It's going to drag all that sweat and dirt into your wound. And then if it hits a bone, Bam! It slaps into it and it shatters bone, okay? It's really a dull hit, okay? And what that means is, you know, you're going to have terrible wounds. By the way, you could survive 10 of these things, okay? Depending on where it hits you, or one, of course, could kill you, okay? So it really depended what you were talking about. The worst one I know of is a soldier who on the first day uh, was shot, thank you, through the lungs. Um, a survivable wound, believe it or not. And, you know, this guy, he left the war, but he survived. Um, went back and had breathing troubles for the rest of the 60s until in 1870, something like seven years after the Battle of Gettysburg, he had a bad coughing fit and coughed up a five by seven inch piece of his uniform that had been driven into his lung during the Battle of Gettysburg. The bullet took it in and he took a picture of it and he said his breathing trouble went away. Now, I've had a lot of surgeons on tours who tell me absolutely not that's made up. All I know is I've seen the picture and a guy who was here told the story. So sometimes the guide and the historian can only do that much. I don't have anybody else that can confirm it or deny it other than modern surgeons who, by the way, knew exactly what afflicted Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee. They love to diagnose the people of the past who were long dead and who you can't prove it with. 
All right, I have lots more to say, but we've got another a couple of important stops and an ambitious schedule that includes Little Round Top and Environs, Devil's Den, the Rose Farm that you've never heard of, but you won't forget it if we go, and the Field of Pickett's Charge. Okay? I'm a little disappointed that I haven't heard more ooh, ah, because this is a view. Much better than you think it's going to be when you look at this hill from somewhere else. This is a view, okay? And there we go. Totally unsolicited. Now, the simplest question I could ask you is, would you want to be down there in order to come up here if the enemy was up here with guns? No. 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 Okay. Good. I think that's a pretty good way to stay alive, right? And by the way, in the Civil War, the more people who died, the better you were. Wrap your brain around that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Las Vegas odds. Yeah, <laughs> good point. So this is Little Round Top. That's Big Round Top. And on July 2nd, 1863, on paper, the Union fish hook went from right here, okay, making a beeline past that largest monument there, the Pennsylvania Memorial. And then around that hill where the light blue water tower is, some of you can see that. And then off around to Culp's Hill that way, 90,000 soldiers, okay? But the guy in command here is what we call a political general, okay? This guy didn't go to West Point. He didn't have a whole lot of military training, but he was a, a brave enough guy for sure and had had some experience by now. Dan, I'm gonna say it this way, Sickles, okay? Dan Sickles was no idiot, okay? He would have liked Little Round Top if he came up here, but he didn't like that ground down there, okay? North of Little Round Top, it's low, it's wooded, and he was especially afraid that the enemy, the Confederates, could go to that wood line, and then that wood line, and leapfrog to the next wood line. See, the trees are where they were during the battle, so we can see what Sickles was concerned about. And he was afraid they could get right up to him before he could even use his cannons, okay? So eventually, without any orders, of his own decision, largely, he decides to move his men off of Little Round Top and out to a place to, called the Peach Orchard where he could use his artillery better. Now, it's hard to see, but the Peach Orchard is where that road over there, the Wheatfield Road, meets the Emmitsburg Road near where the Red Barn is that you can see in the distance, okay? And that's really all I want to talk about, okay, for now, for the, for the moment. Dan Sickles moves his men way out there, closer to the enemy to, than to his own troops, okay? Sickles moves half his troops near those two red barns there and then bends them back here to that pile of rocks, my favorite place in the world, Devil's Den. Okay? So instead of being on Little Round Top, he's out in front of it. Now, where's the Confederate line? Well, if you look at that tree line, not the mountains, those are the Appalachian Mountains, by the way, uh, but, and the Appalachian Trail's right up there if you ever heard of that. Pretty cool stuff. That distant tree line there is the Confederate line. Follow it over here past that tower that we drove by behind me, that's the Long Street Tower, past those red barns over near there, and then all the way around, do you see that barn with the three white ventilators on it there? Yeah, yeah? you sure? <laughs> there you go. I'm used to my kids just saying, yeah. <laughs> they could have their eyes closed. Yeah, Dad, I see it. And that three, those three white ventilators above there, the Confederate line goes to that wood line, and if you see a little kind of a a white steeple above that, that's the seminary on the first day that you were seeing yesterday, five miles away from here, okay? Then the Confederate line curves around the cemetery and onward like that, okay? So Dan Sickles has moved his soldiers right up to the enemy, closer to the enemy than to his own troops, and General Meade sees he has done this and is not a happy camper, and he uses some bad words as he tells Sickles how unhappy he is. But he realizes that Sickles' position out here is too dangerous to pull him back to Little Round Top. Meade is going to funnel 15,000 soldiers into Sickles' line to bail him out. Okay, and all I got to say is these 15,000 had to come from somewhere, right? Hold that thought. Okay, but in the meantime, the Union Army's left flank, the end of the largest army in the world, is right there near Devil's Den. But where do the Confederates come from? Big Round Top. Those Alabamians, where we were before, go all the way to the top of Big Round Top, and they're about to come down Big Round Top, come up on this hill, put some cannons up here, and shoot the Union line. They're going to defeat the largest army in the world and win the Battle of Gettysburg, and maybe we live in a much different place today. No. 
at least partially because of this guy, Governor Warren, okay? Governor Warren, weird name, cool dude, is the chief engineer of the Union Army. And what engineers know, among many other things, is the lay of the land. It's called topography. Cool word. You should memorize it. Let's all say it. Topography. 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 Good. And if this guy knows anything, he knows that Little Round Top is a place you'll want to have some soldiers. Through his efforts, within about 20 minutes, he's able to get some Union soldiers, Maine, Pennsylvania, Michigan, um, and, uh, and New York, over to that side of the hill five minutes before the Southerners attack. Okay, you can't write it any better. Okay, the same five minutes the Confederates rested on Big Round Top because any of us, even the young and in shape among us here, would rest on Big Round Top after staying up all night carrying 50 pounds up the steep side of the hill. Okay, so it's a good what if of the battle. What if they'd have been 10 minutes earlier? Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, so that's what I'm setting up. There's not a whole lot of fighting on this side of the hill. And by the way, if the hill looks particularly brown, it's because there was a controlled burn. Sometimes it's much easier, and I imagine a lot of y'all do yard work. Okay burn the whole thing and you don't have to cut everything okay and they just did a controlled burn about a week ago so you're seeing little round top especially clear and if i may cool looking okay yeah i mean there were scrubby bushes down there like you see today the tree line was right here but thinner everywhere you see trees it was thinner because they were grazed by livestock and when a tree fell a farmer actually came down and cut it up and used it i mean people don't maintain woodlots that way so much anymore they don't need the wood to heat their homes the way they used to right good question anything else all right what we're going to do is go right up over the hill check out some monuments on the way and we'll gather near the castle over there if you go in the castle i'm supposed to tell you to wear a mask if you are willing good we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to devil's den why do they call it devil's den four reasons and i'm not sure if any of them is correct Sure. He's going to rub a nose. <laughs> Let's go. You can come on down here, unless you have a burning desire to not be able to see from up there. I must smell bad. <laughs> I'm used to that. Look at you. Look at, look at me. Thanks for mentioning it both. As well as uh, Tony Sheriff, so watch your cop jokes. All right. I should. I can take it. <laughs> We're here. I was trying to plan a trip to uh, Vilas County uh, for September, but it's not going to happen. Alas. My loser friend wanted to go to Little Bighorn instead. Uh, who's your loser friend, Hessler? No, Justin. No. You've probably seen him on Facebook. OK. Yep, we're OK, I don't think anyone up there can hear me, but I don't see anybody up there, so that's OK. So by the way, this is the largest 
Come on, come on closer, don't be shy. Just give me six feet and I'll be good. So that's the largest regimental monument on the battlefield. And again, if you take a few regiments and put them together, what do you have? Anyone know? Brigade. Brigades make? Divisions. Divisions make? Divisions. So now he's pretending like he knew before. Okay. Regiments, brigades, division, corps, army. You might be quizzed on that later. Who knows? But no extra points, okay? But because this particular unit's from New York, ooh, look at me. I want you to notice me. I'm making up for other things. They had to make this giant monument right here, larger than all the other regimental monuments at Gettysburg. But it is pretty cool, okay? These monuments are full of symbolism that I won't punish you much with today, okay? But know that we are on the side of the hill where everything happened here. And as you cycle through to this sign here, you can see somebody said, what did it look like? That photo was taken right there on July 6th, three days after the battle, looking right here. The boulders in that picture are these boulders behind me if you want to check them out, okay? So, this is the side of the hill where everything happened. You can see stone walls down here, and those were in fact built initially by the troops, but not till after the fighting was over. A lot of good it did them then. The Union soldiers who came up here meant for Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania and Maine were not placed on the crest of the hill, the summit of the hill, rather down there at a place called the military crest. It's called that because it's better for military things. If you have to fall back, you're still on the hill. It, it, you have a better field of fire, more things you can shoot over the brow. You don't form a convenient silhouette on top of the hill, okay? There's all sorts of reasons to be down there. So the commander, a guy named Strong Vincent, was smart to put his men down there. Strong Vincent, first in his class at Harvard, do well in school, you can command troops even if you don't go to military school. He's also one of the best looking dudes in the Union Army, according to many, that's what they said. He was that kind of person you'll meet sometime in your life where they show up even if they don't work there and people will listen to them. You'll meet people like this, it's pretty interesting throughout your life, just magnetic, natural born leaders and he's one of them and he puts his guys down there okay they don't have time to build the walls even if they were ordered to before the confederates come off this lower hill right in front of us we're talking about texans here and they attack this position and they are repulsed and sent back the confederates attack again and they're repulsed again one thing you got to know is that the woods there were 150 yards further so every time they attack they are attacking over a broad swath of ground they keep getting slaughtered and some of these Texans have had enough of this, and they are going to try to attack from that direction instead. Hey, let's get around the end of the men from Michigan on that plateau there. It works. Some of the Michiganders begin to fall back. Somebody orders more Michiganders to fall back. There are Texans on that plateau there. There's no more Union troops up here at that time. And the Southerners are getting ready to capture the crest when? A guy named Patty O'Rourke, the guy with the shiny nose who you passed and none of you touched on the way over here. You're gonna get bad luck, just kidding. It's actually, so many people rub his nose because he supposedly has the luck of the Irish, okay? But his luck ran out right on that spot, leading troops into battle when he shot through the neck and he falls as this attack begins. But 539 more men from New York show up over the hill and push the Texans back, okay? But by now, the fight has begun to roll further into the woods over here where Alabama soldiers are gonna fight Maine and Pennsylvania soldiers. And it is particularly intense and goes back like a great wave as they begin that struggle. And we have been, I've been asked to take you all out here so at the best clip you can, after I answer any questions, we're gonna walk down a hill and out to where the Maine soldiers fought, the ones you see in the Ken Burns documentary or the Gettysburg movie. Okay, questions? All righty then. Let's go. Follow me if you can. <laughs> Man, I have a director here. Here we are at Vincent Spur on Little Round Top. So Little Round Top proper's up there, but General Colonel Strong Vincent, he'll be general in a few days after his death. Oh man, you died on Little Round Top. We're gonna go ahead and make you a general posthumously, another good word, okay? After you're dead, we're gonna retroactively make you a general. 
He was smart to put his guys over here. He knew the Confederates might not come from there. He was afraid they would come from there, and so they would. And it's just unbelievable that these two largest armies, basically, in the whole world are going to come together, and the one right flank meets the other left flank almost perfectly. In other words, Chamberlain's line, the 20th Maine, who's on this spur here, ends right here. And the Alabamans who are attacking them attack, and their flank is right here. They, they meet almost perfectly, okay? And in the movie, this is all true, okay? For about 40 minutes, this unit, men from Maine, far from home. Remember, back then, most people didn't leave their state, let alone their county, but once or twice in their lives, okay? This is, this is a sedentary society compared to what we have, where people are all going around and everything like that, okay? So, um, you have the Maine soldiers over here. You have them ready to defend. And then you have the most tired Confederates on the battlefield, the 15th Alabama, the guys without any water in part, who climbed Gettysburg's tallest hill on this part of the battlefield, came down the other side and they launched an attack. This stone wall was again not built until after the battle, so the main soldiers are just lined up somewhere right on the brow of this hill here. They repulse the Confederates who fall back to the woods there. The Confederates attack again with the rebel yell, and real quick, after I say go, I want you all to go, hey, and you all to go, ay, 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 and you all to go, woo, 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 okay, really quick. What are you going to do? Yeah, except woo, 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 like a Indian, like a war whoop, and you all? Okay, and you all? No, yeah. Okay, let's try it in three, two, one, rebel yell. All right. Good job. That sounded good. Now imagine, see, it hurt her ears. Imagine 500 of them. You hear it before you can see it. They're coming out of the woods. They attack, but they fall back again. But now the commander over there, a guy named Oates with an extra E in it, is going to extend his line. See? You think you're smart. Well, I'd have just gone around. Well, both sides know that the other side's going to do these things, right? You're always trying to get around the end of the enemy line, the flank. It's like doing this. Imagine if I come over here and I start shooting like this, okay? If I don't hit you, I'll hit you or you or you or you. Now imagine me with 100 friends as if I have that many that I really can't miss, okay? People who are flanked, that's what you are now, run away or get shot. It's that simple, okay? And even if it seems like they have a death wish, they don't. So. Oates starts to move his men so that he can attack from that direction over there, okay? Chamberlain, his, his main men see that they can do that, and they take every other man, and they stretch out their line and bend it back along this ridge here. You might be able to see a little stone wall over there, so that when the Confederates attack from that side, they're going to meet more Union soldiers. And this goes back and forth again, like I said earlier, like a great wave. The Confederates are punching through the Union line. The Yankees are falling back until Chamberlain's side and Chamberlain's side over there are almost touching. This is an intense fight. Five times do the Confederates try to capture this hill, and five times, just barely, does the Union actually finally hold them off. And right when the Southerners are forming for what might be their sixth charge, Joshua Chamberlain famously says, I can't hold for another attack. I I'm, I'm told I can't retreat. I'm going to advance. And they put bayonets, sharp swords. These are not just little pinpricks or anything. These are sharp swords on the end of their guns, and they begin to swing down into the Confederates, doing the Union huzzah. Not as cool as the rebel yell, maybe, but if we just say it right now, you say the word huzzah three times. Let's try it. Huzzah! 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 There we go. The Wisconsin soldiers would have been saying that, too. I like the energy there. That was really cool. And they're going to start going down. And the Confederates, who staying up all night, climbing that mountain, 50 pounds of stuff, no water, had finally had enough. And they ran like a herd of wild cattle. Where do you go when you were retreating in the Civil War? From where you came. Back up big round top in this case. And from what I've read, these guys, a lot of them, the hundreds of them that were captured, were happy to be captured. Because they could finally get the two things they wanted most. What do you think a soldier like that wanted at that moment? Go ahead. Bam! Two out of two. Good job, man. Rest and water, okay? The way our minds work, okay, is that we focus on our physiological need. If any of y'all, and I'm sorry to do this, have to go to the bathroom like right now, like really bad, you're probably not listening to me because that's what you're thinking about, okay? And if you're tired, hungry, and thirsty, you're thinking about food, water, and sleep, not independence and slavery and the minutia of battle, another good word, okay? In this case, the Confederates aren't thinking about rotting away in a northern prison in Elmira, New York, or um, in Johnson's Island, Ohio. They're thinking, I need to rest right now, and I'm really thirsty. And they could get those two things by surrendering, and so they did. The Ch Chamberlain's men and other men go and occupy big round top there, and this side of the line is secure. 
okay? But there's still terrible fighting going on at Devil's Den, and there's terrible fighting going on at other places that we'll talk about as well. Later, Joshua Chamberlain and his soldiers would come back and dedicate the 20th Main Monument and also place a monument to some of their soldiers that were out there that managed to fire into the backs of Oates' men while they were retreating, thinking they were surrounded. So this battlefield, you could come here. I mean, I lived here for 10 years. I still come up here all the time. And just the other day, I, I marched 20 mi 21 miles with Doug Dowds um, around the battlefield. I stood in five fields I've never even stood in before. You could study this thing the rest of your life. I'm not telling you to. But if you like it, it's there for you. And sorry, let me pontificate one more time. If you can find something, I'm talking to young people here that you like, you know, you've been in school, it looks like you're ranging, but I'm gonna say, you know, six years, nine years, 11 years, depending on how old you are. Just know that you're gonna go to school for another five, six, seven, 11 years, and then you're gonna work for 40 or 50. So try to find something you wanna do. It might take you 20 or 30 years to get there, but do your best to do that. Grown-ups can't, can't not give advice, and that was mine. Anything else? Questions? Why did the battle at the, in the D field happen in comparison to this? Good. So when did that, that, our first stop happen compared to this? And this is one thing about seeing these cool places is that we're doing things a little out of order. This was about 6 p.m. on July 2nd. That was about 5 p.m. on July 3rd, 23 hours later, roughly. Okay. After the second day's fighting all over, after Pickett's charge is over, it's one of the last actions at Gettysburg. Gary, uh, Sir? yesterday I made a disparaging remark about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and called him a self-promoter. Yeah. And Carolyn Ivanov took a whip to me. Yeah. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. So, you know, all of us are this way, right? I mean, if we are in a fight and we win, you want to be fighting the toughest, baddest person out there. And if you lose, you want to be fighting the toughest, baddest person out there because either way, it makes you look better than it otherwise would have, okay? And with each five years, that person I was fighting might be getting even tougher and tougher and tougher. And when the people around me start to die who were there and I could say whatever I wanted, I, that, that person might get tougher and tougher. And that's Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Few things in mind. Chamberlain commanded just one of the four regiments here. This isn't the most important thing at Gettysburg, but it is about the most famous. Why? Chamberlain lived. The three other regimental commanders here were all dead within a year. He could write really well. He was wounded later in the war, okay? He was a governor of Maine, a college president. Who's gonna tell the story of Little Round Top? Joshua Chamberlain. Now, he wasn't completely unreasonable. We have it documented. His story changes every 10 years, and it makes him and his troops look a little bit better all the time. And one other Maine soldier took issue with that, and he said, hey, Colonel Chamberlain, I heard you've been claiming, sorry, General Chamberlain later, I heard you've been claiming a lot of credit for the 20th Maine. Um, you know, I always thought it was the 19th Maine that did the lion's share of the work. And Chamberlain, who was also sort of a politician, said, yes, but isn't it all the slats in the fence that keep the pigs out of the garden? I, I like that. You know, Chamberlain was claiming all the credit, but when somebody tried to call him on it, he says, it was all of us who stopped the Union. By the way, it was mostly me, but it was all of us. So he was a human like anyone else, and I'm more with you. You've also noticed that we don't see many Confederate monuments around here. They were all back where the fighting wasn't. And we have in part to thank Joshua Chamberlain for that because he was on the commission here and did not want Confederate monuments all among these things. One of the Southerners, John Oates, uh, William C. Oates, lost his brother here who probably died right over there. And Chamberlain said, no, there's going to be no marker to Confederates inside my lines. Even though Chamberlain himself said, they push us back, we almost touched. He said, no way. So none of us is perfect. And as you see in the follow it, it's really hard to measure up 50, 100, 200 years later. I mean, you know, Whatever you think that you're doing is right now, some element of it, to no fault of your own, will be looked at differently later. That's how the past works. All right, good. Let's go. Okay, so now we're going to walk straight back over the hill to our cars. There will be traffic coming on both sides. And then we're going to get in our cars. We're going to go to a stop sign. We're going to turn left. We're going to turn left into another happy place called the Valley of Death. I will encourage you to look back up a little round top and think about the one word that they use to describe it, the Confederates, impregnable. That means can't be. Devil's Den, okay? You know, I wrote a whole book about this place. 
I don't know exactly to answer your question from earlier why it's called Devil's Den, what Devil's Den actually is, or when Devil's Den got its name, but I'm close to knowing all those things. As to when, the local people who lived here said that this strange pile of rocks was called Devil's Den from long before the Battle of Gettysburg, but there's not a single written instance we can find where people actually referred to that in print. The first one we know is a couple days after the battle where soldiers started calling this the Devil's Den, okay? So that's probably about when. As to where the Devil's Den is, we still disagree on this. Here's the sign, I guess we're at Devil's Den. Most people go to that largest rock over there and think that's the Devil's Den, but the people who really popularized the name thought the Devil's Den was something much more specific that I'll show you shortly, okay? As to how it got its name, the most common story goes that there's a 30-foot snake that had the width the size of a man's waist, and it would eat little kids for breakfast every day, and they could never kill or capture this terrible reptile, so he always eluded them, and they called that snake the devil. And they figured he died in the rocks among his lair, and that's why this is called Devil's Den. Okay, those stories didn't come out for a while um, afterward, but later people started telling stories and saying, you know what, my great grandfather um, was actually here and with uh, some uh, Native Americans, and they used to call it Raccoon Den. And there was some man named DeGroff who uh, he went in there, and three angry raccoons charged on him for trespassing, and he lost a good deal of blood and he was almost killed. There's another story about an old snake that it was apparently turning gray with age and he was supposedly 20 feet long and they sick the dog on the snake and they thought from the capacious mouth of the snake that it would swallow the dog, okay? And, you know, one guy said Frank, called Frank Armstrong, said his grandfather used to talk of this big snake and before him the Native Americans here used to talk about it and call it Heap Big Snake, which is just, just too perfect. It fits just a little bit too well. For my part, I think that if you go around the country to a place not too far from you, Devil's Lake, you know, it's rocky. Devil's Slipper, Devil's Bath, Devil's Tower, it's all rocky areas. And in this particular area, the Pennsylvania Dutch farmers hated rocks like most farmers. In fact, some of them believe that the devil put the rocks in the field to mess them up and whatnot. And maybe that's why this is called Devil's Den. Of course, maybe it's called Devil's Den because of the terrible fighting that took place here. And then the terrible photographs of the dead strewn among the boulders here, okay? combination of, uh, in my opinion, I think it has nothing to do with a snake. I think it has a sort of a sinister looking appearance here. I've always thought there could be a state park here without having a battle ever fought here because it's such a wild looking place and situated near a beautiful valley with other rocks, okay? Speaking of the rocks, these are not glacial rocks, which are sort of icy, but rather much older volcanic rocks, which geologists say, not necessarily everybody in my company, are 201.2 million years old. Okay, not everybody agrees on that. Here we go, I was very careful. I learned on one of your previous tours, okay? Um, which they say bubbled up through the earth and formed in and then hardened and then tumbled down into this area. And the reasons, you didn't see rocks yesterday on, on the first day's field, and we didn't see rocks hardly at all where, you, where we met, is because there happens to be that all this magma that runs through this part of Pennsylvania goes on an angle and it just happens to go to the ends of the fishhook line. So you happen to see rocks on the round tops in Devil's Den and rocks on Culp's Hill and hardly anywhere else at Gettysburg. So it's pretty interesting. A geologist once said the three-day Battle of Gettysburg was an attempt by the Confederates to drive the Union Army from the diabase outcroppings of the Gettysburg Sill, the nerdiest thing I'll probably say all day today, okay? So that's what that is, right? Now, Devil's Den is, I think, most famous, you know, because of the photos that were taken here. In fact, some of the most terrible photos of the Civil War were taken here, and of all the most terrible photos, of which there are 104, exactly, 104 photos known of dead soldiers on battlefields in the Civil War, 37 of them were taken at Gettysburg, and 16 of those were taken here at Devil's Den and this area over here called the Slaughter Pen. I'll show you some of those locations, okay? Um, but first, let's walk over this way a little bit. By the way, some of you may have remembered from before, if anybody likes a challenge and doesn't want to bash their head in, I hope, if you run from that curve straight up at that rock and you get up on that rock without using your hands, that's the challenge of the run-up rock. By the way, amateur, beginner, low, medium, high, very high, and if you can get up there without using your hands, there's no words for it. It's just 
So if anybody wants to try it, run straight at that rock as fast as you can and don't hurt yourself. And remember, I'm 54. I did it two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> but, but the key is the first time you do it, don't go for the hard part. Angle over toward the easy one. It's all about the speed. Okay. If you guys need me to do it first, I will. But I'm getting older, so I'm not doing it at the high or very high. I have bad shoes, and yet still, it's just not that hard, I think. See? So amateur. Huzzah! Good. Low, medium, high, very high, and this is, you don't have to do this, but while I talk, if anybody wants to try, go ahead. I mean, I'm like ancient. Surely you guys could do this. Don't call me Shirley. Hold on, wait. You don't have to do it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't stutter step. Oh, yeah. He did it. <laughs> well done. Oh, he's going high. Look at that. Oh, now they're encouraged. Look at that. Well done, y'all. That's three for three. Don't slow down, whatever you do. Oh, it's always slowing down is what kills you. You got to hit that thing at full speed. And now Mr. Weggy's going to do it. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah, that was just a couple weeks ago. It's a controlled burn. Controlled burn, yeah. Totally intentional. They do it every few years. Oh, no. Some places they wouldn't let you do that. Yeah. Well, faced with, faced with trying to do it by hand, they do it. It's great. You're welcome. Enjoy your stay here. <laughs> oh, but he wins points for style. Yeah. All right, last few. Go ahead. Go. And please stay out of the road, parents. There's cars coming soon. Out of the road. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Here we go. Oh, Almost. Oh, nice no. try. <laughs> He's going. He got a slow start, but oh, yeah. Oh, wait, was that the, no, that, the that was very high or high. The look is to the right of that. <laughs> No pressure. Oh, he puts a hand down. All right. Come on, y'all. And come, Dave, will you lead him over here? Yeah. You know. Alfred. Alfred. Camera here, guys. We're here on the cement black top surface area. And we're also off the road. <laughs> this will be a short stop. I'm mostly trying to show you this. Anybody finds a black phone, Mr. Wages is missing an action. I, I, we're waiting on you. I see. I see something laying on the ground right there, shiny, but it looks blue. Could be a water bottle, same on you guys. Okay, just real quick. So. On July 6th, 1863, with dead soldiers all around us, the photographer Alexander Gardner photographed this sketch artist, apparently sketching in the sketch right here. See where his foot is, sort of in a little crink in the boulder? There's a nice little spot for your butt here. And for those of you standing right here, the crack right behind my head, do you see it behind Alfred Wad's head? It's perfect. And the overhanging rock over here, okay? Because there happen to be boulders, you figure out where the photos were taken. Okay, which is a little bit, uh, can be a little bit disturbing. Okay, just so you all know. I really just wanted to show you this. Let's cross the road carefully and we'll meet over there. Why don't you hand out those glasses, if you will? Wasn't there a picture of a guy dead right on these rocks? Sort of. 
Not quite right there, but you're almost there. You're probably thinking of the one on top. We'll go up there too. What's that? I might. Yeah, either get on the wall or over here is the best, actually. We got so we we'll have. Down into the grass here. Nothing there gonna bite you much. Caden, nice work on the rock. Andre, nice work on the rock. Thanks. Kayla, good attempt. So. Ethan, good attempt. I agree. Kayla, Everybody. Ethan. You actually did much better than most school groups we have, so well done. Uh, indeed, and tough, hardy Midwesterners. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Not an upper, you know, this is a battlefield. And by the way, you know, here we are in a battlefield. Soldiers died where we were just cheering and huzzahing, right? There's no exact code of conduct on how to act on a battlefield. You know, I've seen people cry. I've seen them get happy. I've seen them be mad. I've seen them lash out at me. So as long as we remember, you know, that this is a battlefield and it was a cemetery here. If you died here, they dug a hole here next to you, or might likely in this case threw you right into there, um, and then buried you. And then maybe if you were a Union soldier, you'd be moved to the National Cemetery. And if you were a Confederate soldier, you'd remain in the ground for about eight years until removed south as unidentified piles of bones um, by a Southern ladies group, okay? But because they waited so long and there were just so many people killed outright here, close to 10,000, um, we estimate there's still hundreds of remains on this battlefield. So it still is a cemetery. We should keep that in mind. The veterans came here and they got heavy and serious. They also laughed. They used the battlefield as a bathroom, you know. So we have to keep in mind wh where we are, but you can have fun on a battlefield in case anyone was wondering. An interesting thing is that most Civil War photos, people don't know it, were taken in 3D. They weren't only taken in 3D, they were taken as if that's the only way you would ever see them. And I'm going to pass this book around and later I'll show you more of them, so hang on to your glasses or give them to your parent. Um, but I'll pass this one around. You can see some of the photos of the dead. The one on the left is actually right out there, but some brush has fallen, so it's hard to get to. But I'll show you some other ones. So just pass these around. And they are disturbing. I'm sorry. Um, but this is how photos were taken in the Civil War, as if you'd only see them that way. And until it gets to you, just know that we're standing in this place. It's called the slaughter pen. This photo was taken from right behind you, looking behind me there. Okay. So, and I'll show you a blow up in a sec. These, the one I'm showing here is not 3D. Wait for the book for the 3D stuff, okay? So you can't really see it, but people were really enthralled with this photo because it shows dead soldiers among the boulders. And that's what I'll show you here. If you get to look at it close enough, you'll see a leg or you'll see a thigh or you'll see a, a body or something like that. Do you see any? Nod your head if you do, okay? So in other words, they were strewn about the rocks right here. And, you know, they called it a slaughter pen. That's a biblical reference from what I know. Probably Old Testament if I know it. And it, it became a, a place of wild fascination. The photographers would sell these photos in 3D, and then people would take them back home and, sh and look at them in their parlors. This is how you traveled the world back then. They didn't have Netflix or Blockbuster or anything like that. I'm going to make myself sound old. People traveled the world by looking at 3D photos in their parlors, okay? Can you the yeah, yeah. You, some of you may have even seen it. it the, the, the photos you would buy were a set of two photos. They looked identical, but they were taken an eye-width apart, which is why you see in 3D, by the way. Okay, 3D vision is normal. You guys can see it. Something is further than something else, right? But then they took a device, and people realized this long before photography was invented, that if you put it in there and taught, tricked your brain into separating them and putting them together, that you could see in 3D on a flat image. And that's what they did. So you put it in a little hood with two lenses with a separator between them, and you'd look at it and focus it, and it would come out in 3D. Pretty cool stuff. It's just what I'm doing. Thank you for taking that around. Except that one uses red and blue to separate the colors. Now, in addition to taking photos from behind you, the photographer set up right here, right here is camera, and took a photo look in that way, okay? And I'll point you toward the largest rock over there on that bank, or that sort of rock with a crack in it that I'll point you with my finger here. And you can see, this is 2D also, uh, you'll see two Southern soldiers on that bank right over there, okay? Probably killed four days earlier.
Does everyone see if you can that largest boulder over there? Trust me, those guys are laying right on that bank. So if you can get a good enough look at this, you can see, yeah, that this cracky rock over there is the one on the right. You can even see the tip of this rock in that pond. In other words, you're looking right on that bank there, okay? And so these guys who look a little grotesque now, you know, had been lying motionless in death for four days by the time the photographer found them. This is July, okay? It had rained also. It was not a pleasant place to be. But then the photographer went on top of that rock in the middle of the little pond there and took a photo of one of the soldiers more close up. In other words, on that rock there, looking across. And just look away if you don't want to see any of this stuff. Now, what you see, and I'll show you a blow up if you want to see it, is a dead southern soldier. He's got a hole in his right temple. And what was inside his head is kind of dripping out and forming a little puddle next to him. This is not a happy thought, okay? By the way, this guy charged into battle full of life four days earlier and looked human. But now he's bloated. This is what happens when you die, right? You, you take on all sorts of nastiness, right? It's called putrefaction. Uh, put I'll explain in a sec. Okay. Good question. Uh, it's called putrefaction, okay? These were shown in 3D in photographic studios, such as Matthew Brady's. And one newspaper reporter seeing them a few months before that said, if Mr. Brady, the photographer, has not taken the bodies and laid them out in our dooryards, he has done something very like it, okay? People had never seen war before. They thought war was glorious. My ancestor must have died on top of the fort with the American flag across his breast with a little trickle of blood running, uh, uh, you know, from his mouth. Not this sad thing. Not lonely, bloated, far from home, unidentified. Okay, terrible. Now. I'll show you one last one here, and that is a close-up of this guy's face, who doesn't much look like a guy anymore, but you can see the hole in his head, right? Now, I don't show this to be sensationalistic. I show this because that guy was not what we call mortally wounded. He didn't get wounded and then died. This guy was killed, okay? Because of that, I know he died right there, because of that. I know he's either an Alabamian in the 44th Alabama or a Georgian in the 2nd Georgia. Because a lot of the Georgians and Alabamians from those units who died here died in hospitals and in other places, I have him narrowed down to about 30 different people it could be. That's probably the best I can do for him. These photos of the human carnage not only shock the nation, but they also help us to understand the place a little bit better. Um, and that's why I study them so much, okay, because they're rare, 104 at only eight different places. Okay, so we study those like we study other things as well, even if the, you know, the view is unhappy. Questions? Sir? Have you had a recent invitation of the Civil War Roundtable in Milwaukee? No. And last time I did Milwaukee was, I think, 2015 or 16. And I did Chicago at the same time, because that's what you all do. Um, and I have been spending most of my walking time, and I walk 15,000 steps a day, listening to the old recordings of the Chicago Civil War Roundtable thing. And, it, and I uh, confess that I wouldn't mind going back All if right. I'm going to do both. So if we can work it out. All right. I'll put a bug in the proper ear. I am sorry I'm not a member of Milwaukee, but uh, I did rejoin Chicago because they put up 400 podcasts of so many historians of the past whose voices I never thought I'd hear, and I get to hear them talking about things I'm interested in. I, I love these things, if anybody's a real nerd here. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do one of those. Depends what stage it is, but we'll go up okay, there. Last question is, sure. uh, on, uh, okay, it was 90 degrees on July 3rd, and then on July 4th it rained, started to be in on July 5th and 6th. What did that do to the body? Check out the well-informed question, my compliments, first of all. So this idea, putrefaction, right? You know, um, it depends on your physiology, what you're made of, what your diet was, and what clothing you're wearing, okay? But before the photographers already got here, the bodies began to enter rigor mortis, and then they begin to swell, okay, as the gases are released and whatnot, and they bloat. It's the only word to call it, okay? Hordes of flies come up and lay eggs inside, which, it, with, which within two weeks, 10,000 10, soldiers, thousands of horses, which means billions of maggots that'll turn into flies. And every fence post in Gettysburg for a month was completely covered with flies, okay? Rigor mortis eventually leaves, the bloating goes away, but by that time, 
most of the dead are in the ground, okay? Um, they're gonna then remain in the ground, shallow graves. We're not talking about six feet deep here. We're talking about whatever you could. And that's why I suspect the dead were thrown in here because there's rocks underneath here. Even if you see soil, there's rocks underneath. Very hard to bury people here. And they talked about extracting dead soldiers with meat hooks from the rocks of Devil's Den. It's just terrible. Um, so, I mean, all, it's gonna happen to all of us, you know, uh, but I guess, I guess our country makes it harder, you know, no. Our country makes you put people in a liner if they're buried, if they're not cremated, you know, so that you can't seep into the soil and get eaten by worms. They can't get in. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. We got lots more to see. We're not, we're not behind really yet, but I got more I want to show you here before our next two stops. If anyone wants to see this in 3D, it's on the top there. If you'll pass it around or pass it to the next person. Okay, who crawled through the den? All right, well done, y'all. Even the one with the broken wing. <laughs> Learn to fly again. Give me a sec here. Okay. Okay, now. I will talk about the fighting in a moment. We're going to go maybe reenact a little bit up there. But for now, please know that that's the Confederate line, those trees in the distance, OK? And you can imagine the Georgians, Texans, Alabamians, and Arkansans charging across this field. The woods look just like they did at the time. And they're going to go up this field beyond the road and into those trees there, too. And the Union's going to try to repel them. And sometime during that attack, this soldier fell wounded and maybe more, uh, mortally wounded behind that largest boulder that I'm pointing to over there, the largest one, the only one you can really see on the slope, okay? This guy. The photographer expended four pictures of him. Now, you'll probably take more pictures during this tour than were taken at Gettysburg in the entire Civil War, okay? Because back then, taking 10 photos in a day was a big, big deal, okay? So, the photographer noticed this guy. How does he look different than some of the other uh, dead soldiers I showed you. What's different about him? Anyone see? Not He's not bloated. Okay. Did, does he have a different composition of his body? Did he survive for an extra day or two and then succumb so he hasn't bloated yet? Okay. For whatever reason, this soldier looks like he could be your son. So they took four pictures of him down there and then came up the hill and came upon this place, a stone wall between boulders going toward the middle, little round top visible in the background. The perfect place for a photo, except there was no body, okay? So in a flash of creative excitement, they gathered him up on a blanket that you can see in the 3D photo that's going around there, okay? And dragged him 72 yards up here and placed him there, okay? And created one of the most famous photos of the entire Civil War. The photographer made up a story. He was a sharpshooter. He was killed in this position, and he calmly laid out his clothes and propped up his head to await his death, okay? And for 99 years, nobody knew that he was staged. He is dead, okay? But that he was dragged here from another location, nobody knew until a magazine editor, editor noticed, hey, that's the same guy. You could even see the folds in his clothing, which, you know, the wrinkles in your clothes are like fingerprints when you really look at them. It's the same guy, okay? He made up a story about how he came up later and found the rusted musket uh, four months later as well. Of course, this same gun as a photographer's prop, it appears in several photos throughout, so he made that part up. Said how his skeleton was still there. You can colorize this photo and he looks even more, you know, like we do, so to speak. This, this could be your brother or your son. I doubt you had that thought about people, about the people I showed you earlier, right? Okay, so it's a very famous photo. Now, when I first came here in 1988, my first trip here, and this was all woods, but I knew the dead sharpshooter was somewhere up here. That's what he's called. Even though he's not a sharpshooter, there aren't any sharpshooter units around here. I was walking up uh, that road there, and I was like, and I was writing in my journal, somewhere in Devil's Den, and I looked up and I saw this. 
I couldn't believe it. I'd been looking at that photo for a couple of years already, and here it was, right? And I wrote all sorts of freak out things like, oh, my heart's beating, I can't believe this. And the first thing I wanted to do was lay down right there. Now, yeah, you're laughing because that's not what everybody would think, okay? But there might be someone on here who already had that thought, okay? And that's that thing about interacting with history again. Even though he was dragged to that spot and I knew it, I wanted to experience history right there. If he was still alive, what would he have seen laying right there, okay? And that's what I'm trying to do. I know that if I throw out enough stories, maybe things about birds or books or buildings or uh, battlefields or about military stuff or about photos, that that might grab you and you'll remember it. If you come on a trip like this and really remember five things or four, you know, success from the trip. Okay, so I'm just trying to throw out as much as I can. And for me, that's how I connect with history. That's certainly not for everybody. Um, that's still making rounds around. Any questions? We don't know who he is or was. People keep putting up theories, but go ahead, and then you. Um, it doesn't pertain to this. Okay. But when we were coming over here, I had seen like a head peeking out from behind a rock, like a statue. What is that about? I'm not sure which one you're pointing to. Was it? No, it was over here as we're driving. It's coming down from Little Oh, yeah. Top. Yeah. Coming down from Little Round Top or in front of Little Round Top? It was right yeah, so, so the guys of the 40th New York, known as the Mozart Regiment, they came from three different states and fought under New York, and they were kind of positioned in that low ground there, and when the brush grows up, he, he, the monument actually shows him behind sort of a, a stone wall or an embankment, and when the brush grows up, it looks like he's just peeking up there. Why did they put it there? That's where they fought. That's the great thing. You know, some of you hear in the news about how they're trying to remove monuments from town squares, okay, but they're also trying to remove them from battlefields. And unlike the ones in town squares, these are specifically put here by the veterans themselves to teach us later what happened where. They're place-based monuments, which is why, while I might think it's up to a local town to take down a Confederate monument in their town square, I think that's up to them. I mean, I could imagine if I was an African-American seeing a slaveholder in front of the courthouse where I have to go vote, I could see that being an issue. But for these on battlefields, what, did the Union not fight anybody here? Can we not mark the positions of the army they fought? People get a little extreme sometimes. Has there been any damage at all? No, I mean, people have been vandalizing monuments since they were put up. That one over there, the artillery guy, he's been dragged off that pedestal twice in the 90s, not recently. And his head came off one time. They had to have another one cast from an identical statue that happens to exist elsewhere. Um, so, I mean, but there hasn't been particularly much at national parks. And you haven't, you've seen national parks say, we're keeping these things, okay? But we're going to maybe put up signage to explain what they mean a little bit. Okay, great. Okay, but rampantly judging people of the past and acting on it is always a bad thing. Doesn't mean the people of the past were great, but it's getting increasingly hard. For you grown-ups up here that know what this means, there are elements of the Army that are now saying we can't call it the Union Army, because that's what the Union Army was called. It was the Union against the Confederate. They're saying we have to call it the United States Army. Union is offensive. Most soldiers fought to preserve the Union. Later they fought to free the slaves. So it's very difficult you know, because people of the past never measure up to us today. And judging them and acting that on that is pretty tough. It's complex stuff. With the photographs, which, did they provide, like, locations and everything, like photographers, or did people yeah. have to find those yeah. and, um, and connect to that? The photographers put the locations on there that they thought would sell more photos. A lot of times they're accurate. The original captions of photos, we use them all the time. But to answer your question, absolutely not. One man, my mentor, the reason I've gotten into the Civil War in the first place and without whom I'd have never met my wife or had my kids, took these old photos and tried to find the same place today. All the places I showed you, including this one, I learned from him. He's the first one to make the study of where a photo was taken an actual occupation, okay? Usually historians use writings, okay? Very few historians still take a photo out and learn about that place. Because once you know when and where a photo was taken, suddenly, like the dead guys over there, because I know where it was taken and when, I know who they are approximately, okay? Nobody did that until William A. Frazzanito, to whom I owe my whole career, and he knows it. He wanted me to name my first kid William Frazzanito Edelman. I said no. Anything else? Yes! The closest I came to a Civil War name for a kid 
is when she would come up with some terrible name that I hated. I'm not going to say what they were in case there's somebody here named Nigel or Basil or something like that. But I would bring up a terrible Civil War name. She'd say, how about Nigel? I'd say, okay, then Stapleton. <laughs> She'd say, how about Basil? Oh, how about Snowden then? I had all these. So that's the closest I came to suggesting a Civil War name. They were only to blunt hers. Y'all, real quick, before we do a little thing, okay? You're facing west. You're looking at the Confederate line, the distant tree line you see over there, less than a mile away. In other words, because the Confederates attacked toward us here, they're gonna hit this place first, Devil's Den. Not Little Round Top, simple physics. It takes longer to get there. So this is the first fight on the second day. And we are talking about Alabamians coming up this way, Texans coming up this slope, followed by Georgians, and Arkansans going in there, okay? The Union line, they've got far fewer men, but they've got this position up here, not bad, are on top of the hill or near it there. There's four cannons up there, and you might be able to see that guy from New York standing up there, Augustus Van Horn Ellis. Um, he was a sea captain before the Civil War, so well known that the king of Hawaii, it wasn't a state yet, said, come on out to Hawaii, and I'm going to make you, put you in command of my Navy. Okay, you can be admiral, admiral of the Navy. He was only a, you know, a lieutenant at the time, or before then, he's like, I'll be admiral. He went to Hawaii. There was no railroad across the country yet. What's that called? Transcontinental Railroad. There was no canal where? At Panama. You had to go around South America to get to uh, Hawaii. Six months. He got there, met the king. The king said, glad to have you here. He said, where's my ships? He's like, well, we don't have any. He turned around the following week and came back and arrived just in time for the Civil War. Okay. This guy, First joined a regiment, then raised a regiment, and he was colonel. And by now his regiment, called the Orange Blossoms, is up there with 238 men, the smallest regiment at Devil's Den, okay? And he's up there, and they start to see Confederates coming toward him, okay? The long-range cannon open up, and they're tearing gaps into the Confederate line. The Confederates stagger a little bit, but they seem to be coming from everywhere, okay? And the Southerners are going to push him close. And the men of the 124th New York, smaller in number than the 400 Texans, are going to charge into the Texans. Hmm, why would you do that? Let's try to do this a little bit. If you consider yourself a grown-up, stay where you are. If you consider yourself a kid or a young person, go over near that wall and I'll lead you across, okay? Now, among the grown-ups, I would like it if most of you formed a little line right here. Shoulder to shoulder. Okay, good. Except, yeah, you guys keep going. Except, hold on, I need some more grown ups. You willing to participate? I got to make off. Oh, look, he, he, he doesn't care about the Civil War. You two come over here, uh, including you, sir, Operation Coffee. Okay? You stand about 10 steps over that way until you're called upon. Right. But will you form like this, shoulder to shoulder, but, but in this direction? There you go. Okay, now, I'm gonna have to scream over the wind here. Cross the wall safely if you can. I think there's a break right there. We are the Texans, you are the New Yorkers, okay? I don't know who you are yet, I'm not gonna say. Watch your step, please. Yeah, you are Matthew Brady. He's here during the fighting. <laughs> Hope that's not live. Okay, okay, go a few, few more steps here and then form a line shoulder to shoulder facing the grown-ups. Shoulder to shoulder, there we go. Good, good, good. All right, now real quick, if we wanted to move forward, I would just say forward march, don't do it yet, okay? If we wanted to wheel this group, let's say the enemy was over here, okay, we would Wheel, where you just stand and march in place, you start to walk, you walk, and you guys start running. Let's try it real quick, okay? In other words, I want you to end up like this, okay? So that's called a right wheel. So you're gonna almost stay still and just pivot. You're gonna walk a little, you're gonna walk faster, and you're gonna move faster. Company right wheel, march. Good, check it out, good, good. Catch up, catch up, catch up. All right, company halt, good. Now, if I wanted to get you back to where you're going, I could turn you about and do that another way, or I can just say, 
Uh, right face, in other words, face me. Right face, good. Forward march. Follow me. Follow me. Good. Right face, form your lines. There you go, good. Check it out. Pretty good stuff. Now, here we come, forward march. Start shooting. Stay closed up, shoulder to shoulder. Okay, halt. Okay, at this time, you're like, uh-oh, and the New Yorkers start to move forward to the wall. Uh-oh. You don't want to come all the way over. Come up closer, a little closer. Shoot. No, wait, don't go. Shoot. <laughs> okay, you halt. Okay, you've got them in good straight. Let's come all the way up to the wall and start shooting. Okay. Oh, look, look what's happening. You're shooting. Oh, no, here come the Alabamians. Shoot. Hey, that is the least enthusiastic attack I've ever heard. There we go. Bang, bang, bang. Keep shooting. Hop over the wall with a rebel yell. Woo, 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 woo. Whoa, look at him. Hey, look at that. Okay, you're in trouble, right? What happened to you? We're dead. What, what, why? You got flanked, okay? Okay? See how this works? Now, imagine that right wheel thing. What if they're like, oh, the enemy's over there. Let me wheel over there. Then you're on their flank. If you can show up in two directions against your enemy, that's cool stuff if you're the one doing it. It's not cool when it happens to you, okay? And in this triangular field, Augustus Van Hornellis led a charge on horseback. Some of his men said, don't go in on the horse. They'll be able to see you and shoot you. And you know what he said? The men must see us today, okay? In other words, he was saying that in the Civil War, you had to display reckless bravery in front of your troops under fire, even if it meant your death. And he will be killed. His major, wearing the locket of his brand new bride, Major Cromwell, will die out in this field, okay? They recover their bodies, fall back. The Alabamians and the Texans come up, and they capture the cannons up there, three out of four of them, okay? But by then, other troops come up and recapture the crest, and more Georgians show up and they recapture the crest, and all of this is in about 20 minutes, okay? So Devil's Den changes hands three times, and by the time the Confederates have captured it, they've suffered 33% of their number in casualties. That's killed, wounded, captured, or missing. And they're out of bullets, and none of these guys go on to attack Little Round Top. That's the importance of this fight. That's the biggest thing, never goes backwards, so always forward. Yeah, that's really tough. It's a really good point. Because if you guys do go to Culp's Hill and do what he was talking about, this New York unit, they bent back like this. So if you want to get and, and refuse and get back your line, you want to walk backward, but it's really hard to do. So the inclination is to go like this. Okay, but then the enemy's shooting you in your back. And know this, that there is hardly any worse thing that can happen to you. The death itself is nothing compared to your parents getting a letter that you were shot in the back, meaning you were like running away or something. Okay, let me go into this real quick, okay. When somebody was dying on the battlefield, okay, this thing called honor, which still exists today plenty, but it doesn't inhabit our society the way it once did, okay. The first thing the soldier's thinking about is how he looks, how his death is going to appear. There's a guy at Second Manassas who uh, is looking for wounded and whatnot, swinging lanterns at night, and they, he, he hears a pitiful wail and recognizes that it's his son. And he says, my boy, is that you? And uh, the boy sees him and says, Father, I, I'm not crying because my leg was shot off. I'm crying because when my leg was shot off, I fell backward onto a hornet's nest and they've been stinging me ever since, okay? Please pull me out. And the dad pulls him out, it's a terrible story. He dies in his arms. But this was his first concern, this kid. It's, he went into battle, performed armorably, lost his leg, and he's still concerned about how he's acting, okay? This is why in a battle, soldiers will often retreat this way, so they get accused of being shot in the back, even though it takes four times longer, okay? A war where if you're carrying the flag and get shot, and you pick up the flag and get shot, you two will fight for the privilege to drop your gun and pick up the flag because that's a point of honor, okay? It's a different kind of war. Camouflage is not, isn't really even around yet, okay? And where, as I said earlier, the more soldiers you lost, the better you did, 
I figure if I lived through a fight, I did pretty well now. Back then, it was it meant you stuck to your post and did your duty. That's why Augustus Van Horn Ellis is killed here, because he insists to go in on horseback, because that's what he's supposed to do back then. Okay? Questions? Okay, what we're going to do now is uh, drive and we're going to park in a, the bloodiest place at Gettysburg called the wheat field. Time allows, we're going to walk and see something unforgettable, and I think we'll be able to do that. And then we'll go around and do walk Pickett's Charge, okay? So our cars are over the hill there, follow me. We, there weren't all that many fewer of us crossing the wall than there was during the battle. Like I said, across the way, New York and Ohio soldiers bulged out over there. Vermont soldiers bulged out over there. So all the Confederates were advancing into a three-sided box, okay? But nonetheless, some of the Virginians, Garnett's guys, some of Kemper's guys, come up and actually capture the stone wall. It gets too intense for some of the Pennsylvania units over here. They break and run. The Pennsylvanians with the pointy monument over there bend back into that clump of trees there, bend back into the clump of trees, and uh, they continue to deliver fire into the Confederates, okay? Now the Reserve Brigade comes up. Louis Armistead, hat up on his sword, says, follow me, boys, give them the cold steel. And he leads them up over the wall in a bid to capture those cannons over there. This is a particularly intense fight as you have the reinforcements just beginning to arrive and you've got a fight going on here, foot to foot, man to man, covered in sweat, black with smoke, red with blood. They're struggling hand to hand in here, okay? The commander of the cannons over there, he pushes a couple guns forward. His name is Cushing. He's been shot once and then shot in uh, the groin and he's holding back his insides with one hand, giving the order for one last shot with another. He falls dead as a result of his wound. Armistead, with his hat up on his sword, puts his hand on one of the cannons. Turn the guns around, boys. And if you could stop time right there, right there. The Southerners have come across this field, captured the position they were assigned to capture, sort of split the Union Army in two. But time does not stand still. And first one, then two, then three, then five, then 10,000 Union reinforcements arrive. In the end, a few hundred Confederates cross this wall and thousands of reinforcements are now coming this way. And it goes from this moment of great promise for Robert E. Lee's army to by far his greatest defeat. Robert E. Lee lost 23 battle flags in this attack, more than he lost in the entire war up to that point combined. Scarcely 6,000 of the 12,000 soldiers who made this attack made it back 45 minutes later. The Union troops were chanting what? Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg! Fredericksburg to say they were getting back the Southerners for the wholesale destruction they'd reached from them earlier. The Union finally won. They beat Lee on their home soil. They're chanting Fredericksburg. Some of them are dragging the captured flag through the mud yelling victory. Finally, okay? But Robert E. Lee then took responsibility. That's what kind of guy he was. This is all my fault, okay? Say, get ready in case they counterattack. And some people criticize George Gordon Meade for not counterattacking right away. But I don't know, I don't know about you, but why would he counterattack across the same field that, Lee, that he just slaughtered Lee's army on? Plus, getting an attack like that ready doesn't take 10 minutes, okay? It doesn't take 20 minutes, it doesn't take 45 minutes, okay? You try to get 10 or 12 or 15,000 soldiers moving without cell phones, okay, or walkie-talkies or anything like that, okay? So there's no more fighting really that day except the cavalry fighting we talked about. Then, the following day, through the pouring rain, as I said earlier, Lee stayed at Gettysburg and said, come on, Meade, attack me. He consol consolidated his lines a little bit. Meade doesn't take the bait. That night, Lee goes back through the mountains. The following day, he um, gets further, and several days later, gets back into Virginia. And then people, in this case, all politicians, criticize George Gordon Meade for letting Lee escape, okay? And let me get this straight, no one could beat the guy before. You finally beat him and beat him pretty well. And they wanted him to bag the Confederate army. Let me tell you, okay, however your loyalties go, you don't bag Robert E. Lee with 40 or 50,000 men. You certainly don't do it. And even when the great U.S. Grant takes command the following year, and I'm a huge fan of Grant, Grant fought him every day for 10 months and could only bag Lee's army when he was outnumbered five to one and starving, absolutely starving army, okay? So Lee says, hey, 
I mean, Meade says, apparently you don't like what I'm doing, I resign. And Lincoln's like, whoa, it's not that bad. Lee goes to Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, and says, um, I cannot accomplish my goals, I resign if you want me to. And Davis is like, yeah, right, I'm going to let you go. Both these guys went on to command until the end of the war. But as I said, there would be a top general, Grant, who would command all the armies, move them together, and knew how to end the war. The worse it is, the sooner it'll be over. And while Gettysburg, with its 51,000 casualties, by far the most terrible battle of the Civil War, it is a warm-up exercise compared to the battles that happened all in a six-week period. Gettysburg was the only big battle of that summer, whereas the following year, the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, would make this look like a warm-up, okay? And like it or not, that's one of the ways the Union won the war. I'd rather have 2.1 million soldiers compared to the South's 900,000 soldiers, okay? And the North had to occupy a lot of territory, but that and this thing you've heard about the North being more industrial than the South and the South being more agricultural was very real. The South was at a massive disadvantage, and for every Southern factory worker, the North had an entire factory. I'll let that sit for a second, okay? So in the end, you know what happens at the end? Meade goes on to command at the end, and I think he's fortunate to have a boss like Grant who knew how to bring this thing to an end. <sighs> Questions? So basically, Lee was so good that with 900,000 people, he could take on almost 3 million. Yes, but remember, well, 2.1 million, depends on when. But, but remember, Lee didn't command all the Confederate armies till the last few months of the war. Okay, Lee only commanded his army, and his army was so important that it became the Confederacy. So what you could say is that Lee, with an average of 60 to 80,000 soldiers, is really taking on multiple Union armies that are probably two to three times its size. I mean, you know, it's not like Lee was really good. Remember, the North is doing the invading, okay? The South has all the friendly people around him, all the food, all the maps, all the home goods and everything like that. So it's hard, ask Britain in the War of 1812 or the Revolutionary War, how hard it is to fight away from your base, okay? The North was always at certain disadvantages and the South didn't have to win. All they had to do was not lose till the North got tired of fighting. And I'm not sure how close it was, but once Lincoln won it, won re-election in 1864, who they knew was gonna push this thing to the end, the South's hopes were really dashed, okay? It's hard to give too much credit to Lee for the military fighting, but make no mistake, there is no more important Confederate thing including Jefferson Davis, including the Confederate Congress, including Lee's army, than Robert E. Lee. Okay, he had become the Confederacy. And it's no surprise that the stories about the Civil War, the most enduring ones, are that of the marble general Robert E. Lee. Nobody's like that. Nobody's that perfect. He's not a god, okay? There's always jokes in the South where somebody's child is saying, I can't find any books about Robert E. Lee. Like, what are you talking about? He's all over. He's like, yeah, but is it the Old Testament or the New Testament? You know? <laughs> That's how Lee was revered in the South for a while. That things are turning against him right now, well, people are taking a harder look at what the South stood for. Complex stuff. And that's what history is. It doesn't just sit as one thing. There, you, you learn more and you revise it as you go. Revisionist history isn't a bad thing. Revisionist history is history. Was he able to relieve the burden on the Shenandoah Valley Well, I mean, no, I mean, the main objective in 63 is to relieve the pressure on Vicksburg, fight a major battle on northern soil, okay, and win. Uh, allow the people back down in Virginia to, um, you, know, uh, you know, harvest their crops and whatnot, and do a few other things, right? But, you know, this campaign didn't last as long as he thought. He was only in Pennsylvania from, you know, mid-June until, you know, July 13th. It was a month. It was only so much time for the South to really, you know, recover from two terrible years of war. Um, the following year, you know, Lee would try to provide some relief in that area. And of course, Vicksburg fell 1,200 miles from here the same week. Okay, a lot of people like to call this the high tide or the high tide of the Confederacy because after Gettysburg, after Vicksburg, and after Pickett's Charge, the Confederate tide receded back, back, back to Appomattox, you know, um, less than two years later. Okay, I don't know if it's the turning point of the Civil War. I don't know if it's the most important battle of the Civil War, but it is the most famous. Why? Biggest battle. Gettysburg Address delivered here four months later, first battlefield preserved, and it was near population centers like Philadelphia, New York, and Washington, okay? They don't so much care what's going on in Arkansas and Mississippi when the army, when the Confederate Army is in Pennsylvania threatening 60% of the northern population that uh, borders Pennsylvania. 
Anything else, y'all? I probably only have time for one more because I got to go. I haven't even looked at my clock. On supper. Yeah. Let's wrap it up this way. Gary Edelman, ladies and gentlemen, give me three huzzahs. Huzzah! 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 Thank you all. Time, last time we had a trip, the young man came up to me and said, why didn't I get a trip shirt? Oh. So here we have campaign 2021. Gary Edelman, thank you so thank much. Thank you, sir. And it looks nice and spelt. I think it'll f yeah. uh, this wiry body of mine. Thank all you. Right. And we need that microphone back, sir. Don't walk off. Good. Of thank you. And, uh, you know, it seems like I have all these Confederate shirts. It's good to have some Yankee shirts. Exactly. Uh, Good luck with that. Uh, the mic's way I have one more question. Okay. Let's start with that.